Okay, so I want you to take out your bulletins, if you would, and if you have a writing utensil, even better. If you don't have a writing utensil, you can just kind of think this. Got an activity for us to kind of get us started and kind of get back into the groove of, of Ezekiel. <clears throat> and uh, what I want you to do, I'm going to ask a question here. What I want, and I want all eyes on me as I say this, what I want is do not try to give me your Sunday school best answer, unless that is true of you. I'm going to ask you a question. Your first gut response, you're going to write that down. The first thing that comes to your gut and your mind, write it down, okay? I did this in the first service, who are mostly professional Sunday school people, and they did not follow directions, but it's okay. But I think, no, it's fine. If it's true of you, you got to be truthful, all right? So, enough of the front loading. Here we go. Everyone ready? Pencils perched. I want you to write down the answer to this question. Who or what is the most important person or thing in your life? Who or what is the most important person or thing in your life? Write it down now. Don't think about it. Just write it down. What is that first gut reaction? Who or what is the most important person or thing in your life? Okay. How many of you... Sunday school answer, wrote Jesus Christ. Good job. Extra jewel in your crown, the three right there. That's, if anyone wants to see where the light of holiness is shining, it is right back over here. Yes. How many people wrote down their children, if they have children? All right. How many people wrote down their spouse, if they have a spouse? Oh, Carrie Pound. I always call her by her maiden name when she does something wrong. So, no, good job. Oh, thank you, honey. That's so nice of you. I may put down a pet, a friend, anyone else like that? Money? You don't have to, no one's going to raise their hand on that one. But they're like, yeah, I put a dollar sign down on that. Show me the bench. No. I ask this question of you, not to guilt trip anybody, because Jesus is a person. He is one of the three persons in the Godhead, and I really should have been if you are professing Christian and walking in faith of the Lord, should have been that gut response. I'm reminded of of doing this actually with with a couple of people. We were playing a game, not in a religious setting, and they were, we were, the the game was, you know, name the top three people that are important in your life. And this person named three people, and none of the three people were his spouse, who was sitting right next to him. And so all of us at the table were like, You know, just like, you know, let's, why don't you try that one again? Try it again, you know. So you, you, you may have missed it. Who is the four most important three people in your life? And he's like, what? And then name three other people. Again, not his wife. And we're all like, you know what? You're on your own here on this one. This is danger, danger, Will Robinson. Now, it's understandable to write a spouse's name, a child's name, maybe a friend or some other object. That's understandable. I get it. But it does beg the question, why didn't I think of God or Jesus first? If you didn't write Jesus down or God, you may be thinking, well, that's an obvious given. And you just told us, don't give us the Sunday school answer. Ah, unless it was true of you. I did put the caveat there. And I said person, and you're thinking Jesus is ascended and not walking around, but he is God in three persons, right? He's one of the, the, one of the persons, so he is a person. But... It should stop us and make us wonder and ponder, if I didn't put his name down, maybe do I take the Lord for granted? Do I take him for granted? That's going to be our our challenge here today as we kind of dive back into Ezekiel. I mean, most of us, it probably ebbs and flows about whether or not the Lord is, is the most important thing and the thing that, that drives, drives us, usually when we need Him most, when our legs have been cut out from underneath us, when we're in a serious valley that we're walking through, we need Him the most and we lean on Him the most because it's the only way that we're going to get through this type of season that we're in. But the seasons that are all great and everything's great and wonderful, it's easy to kind of forget. It's easy to kind of just kind of The cross is back there, but it's not necessarily in my mind. He's not exactly in my mind because life is just peachy. And I'm going along just keeping on, keeping on. And I don't really need to lean on him at this moment. Ezekiel, as we are about to dive back in, 
we are finding him today in uh, the middle or towards the end of him performing sign acts. And what are sign acts? Sign acts are these things that God has sent Ezekiel out to do in front of the people to give them an illustration of sorts of how doomed they are. It's a regular ray of sunshine as you read through Ezekiel 1 through where we're up to right now. Don't read it if you are not feeling happy because it's just going to make you even more sad. But, uh, but that is what he is called to do. He's been raised up to give them this kind of illustration of just how, how, um, how off they are. Uh, and, and where we find Ezekiel today in chapter 8 is towards the end of that ministry, and he's gathered uh, together with him. There are about uh, a group of elders that are, are, are meeting him. Now, as we get into this, these elders are coming to Ezekiel. We think, I say we, the different commentators that I looked at and whatever Google said, but no, as I dived into it, what we think is that these elders are coming, hopefully, for a positive oracle some sort of good prophecy from Ezekiel. You've just spent this whole time telling us how doomed and, and, and everything we are. Maybe let's meet with him and see if we can find ourselves out of this. Is there a time where God is going to do what he always does and says, nah, just kidding, and, and kind of saves them? And, you know, when is that going to happen? And as Ezekiel meets with these elders, with Babylonia bearing down and exile, a very real thing, and the unstoppable wrath that is coming... They're not going to get that good oracle. They're not going to get what they are possibly hoping for. Instead, they receive an education, another education from Ezekiel, a continual lesson from the Lord that illuminates the root cause of their situation. Now, my friends, as we continue this journey through Ezekiel, which, by the way, for everyone that's wondering, was that our time in Ezekiel was supposed to take us all the way up to Advent. After continuing to pour over the text and reading how many chapters there are that basically say we're doomed, I decided to abandon that course of action. <laughs> I don't know how much we all can just take chapter after chapter after chapter of God saying, I'm coming for you. So uh, we, we're not going to do that. We're going to kind of redact that thing down. There is hope in Ezekiel every time that I come to the text. Even when it seems most doom and gloom, there is a ray of hope, and there's a reason, my friends, for that. We need to, as we continue to go through this, don't get worn down by the doom and gloom, but recognize in this prophecy this fundamental truth, that the God in whom we love and serve, who sent Jesus, his Son, is real. He is real. He is real, he is unwavering. His promises are real and true. His faithfulness to his covenant is real and steadfast, even in the midst of his people's sinfulness, their rejection, their abandoning him. He is still real, and his covenant is still real, and his truth is still real. But our sinfulness as fallen people, even when we read it now and as we read about them, it messes with our belief system. And we begin to think that God may be not be all that real or not all that relevant to our lives. And we get ensnared and fall into the traps that we see these very people get ensnared and fall into. So let us return to Ezekiel and let us learn that, yes, the wages of our fallen ways is this unstoppable wrath and judgment that's going to come upon us all, yea, thanks be to God, but also that he is a God of immense grace an immense hope, and he goes through extenuating lengths in order to loosen us from those snares, in order to save us from this due penalty that's supposed to come, and to make good on this. He has a claim on our lives, both through them, the chosen people, and now us through Christ. There is a claim on our life, and he's going to make good on that as we are his chosen, beloved children of God. Amen? Amen. So let's, no one said amen to that. Amen? amen? Amen. Do not make me look bad in front of Pastor Mitchell. All right, here we go. So let's open up the text to Ezekiel chapter 8, everyone. Let's open that up and let's look. So today we're going to go to Ezekiel 8 and 9. I'm not going to read the entire chapter to, chapters to you. We don't have time for story time with Pastor Mike. So I'm going to kind of go through these things and highlight and teach what's happening. Remember, Ezekiel's at the end of his sign illustration ministry here, and these elders have come to meet with him. Let's see what happens here. They want something nice. They want some sort of relief. They're not going to get it. So Ezekiel chapter 8, 
Let's dive in. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month. You're like, oh, wow, snooze already. When this happens in the Old Testament and we get this kind of time stamp, if you will, it's to keep us uh, um, chronologically moving along so that we know when these things are happening, when in the time of exile this was going on. And so this is, uh, that's why I'm saying he's at the end. That kind of marcation there saying he's at the end of that sign illustration period and we're kind of getting ready to transition into some other things here. Uh, but not before God continues to double down and double down as to how doomed his people are. It's fantastic. But here we are in the sixth year, the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, Ezekiel says, as I sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me. Now, I've been saying the word elder all this whole entire time. The elder, the office of elder in the Old Testament time is not necessarily the office of priest, as we would expect from the, the, the Levite tribe, etc. What the elders are in the Old Testament, quite frankly, are older people. They are the older folks, the more wise folks. Now, there is a history in the Old Testament about elders. In the time of Moses, Moses was told to gather the elders of the tribe of Israel, the house of Israel, and those elders actually went with Moses to receive instruction from God, the same instruction. And then they also received the Holy Spirit to help Moses out, govern and rule and lead the people, okay? Kind of like overseers. And these elders uh, were respected. And they were supposed to be very learned people. And they were supposed to be skilled in the areas of civil rights and things like that so that during times of court and, and, and uh, trials, they can be brought in and be given, given counsel to whatever is going on there. They also would put them at the front of the gate sometimes too to kind of be the gatekeepers of who's coming in and out of the city to kind of you know, guard that. So they're highly, very, very much important and very revered in Moses' time. But now, and also, and I forgot this too, they had direct line of counsel to the rulers of Israel too. They were considered the council of sorts. And they would influence and be influenced by as you would. So now we fast forward here to Ezekiel, and these elders are coming. But the elders that are coming are not like, not like what we saw back in Exodus with Moses. There have been ages that have passed, and these elders have slipped into God not being relevant, not relevant in their lives. He's, some other, he's another truth, but there's other truths that we can kind of get ourselves engaged in. And now when the going is getting tough, and they come back to the Lord, to Ezekiel, wanting to hear from the Lord, well, the Lord lets them hear and does not give them exactly what they are possibly looking for. So the elders come of Judah to sit before Ezekiel, then the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. I looked, and behold, a form that had the appearance of a man below appeared to his waist, was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness. This is all to call our attention back to the beginning of Ezekiel when he had the original vision, so that we remember, so there's credibility to his prophecy. It's the same person that's speaking to him. That's why the description is the same. He put the form of a hand, verse 3, and took me by a lock of my head, which I think is hysterical. Because, honestly, what that sounds like is that Ezekiel's with the elders and he gets a vision and how God gets his attention is by pulling him from his air and plucking him out of the garden kind of thing. You know, just like, boop! You know, have you ever done that to your kids? Have you ever, like, lifted them up so that they're more eye level to you? Not like from their hair, never. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, you kind of lift them up to get eye level. That's kind of what I see. If God wants to pull me by the hair, that's, that's his form, but I won't do that to my children, no, sir. So, anyways, he put the form of the hand, took him out, the Spirit lifted him up between the heaven and the earth and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north. Again, we're facing north because north is where historically the adversaries come, which was the seat of the image of jealousy. So there is something there that provokes God's jealousy. In verse 4, Behold, the glory of the Lord, the glory of God of Israel was there like the vision that I saw in the valley. Now, let's talk. So what's going to happen next as we're going to go through this vision Ezekiel receives, he gets four of them. He gets four scenes of the growing abominations that are happening of the sinfulness of God's people. These elders that are before him looking for a positive oracle, God's like, well, these elders are the reason and there's a problem that is permeating through the entire nation of Israel kind of because of these leaders and what they have done. 
Let me show you. So the first scene that he says, he brings him to the north gate. And there is an idol, an image of jealousy. We think it's the idol of Asherah. And what they have done is they've placed an idol in front of the front gate to be their guard, to stop the bad people from coming, and that Asherah, well, the goddess of the, of the, of the one that, that has that, that, um, the, the strength and the war and all the things, that that would be the thing that was going to protect them. And God says, let me show you this. This is provoking my jealousy because they have this other God who they think is going to protect them, and it's just a wooden image. It's nothing. And let me show you how I mean by that because guess who's going to come barreling through the front gate? Babylon. Babylonia is going to be coming through, and they're going to take you down to, to your sticks. Down, boom. Good job, Asherah, right? So that's the first abomination. At the end of that scene, God says to Ezekiel, but this ain't nothing. This is nothing. This is just one. Let me show you the greater abominations that have happened. And then we get the second scene. The second scene is now the elders. Seventy of them, Ezekiel numbers them, and that's supposed to see, we're supposed to see the comparison between these 70 elders who are now, as Ezekiel sees, are worshiping other gods near the temple, burning incense to other gods. We're supposed to see the comparison to those 70 elders to the 70 elders of Moses' time who received the Holy Spirit and were set off to be the wise counsel to lead the people of Israel. Those 70 people to lead the people of Israel to great, wonderful things. Now we see these 70 elders who are leading Israel to total ruin. And it's because they are worshiping other gods in secret, believing that God doesn't see them, and if God doesn't see them, they can do whatever they want. God says to Ezekiel, do you see this? Do you see this? And Ezekiel, I'm, I'm thinking, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I see it, yeah. And then he says, but I'm going to show you more. And then there's a third image. Third image is this female woman who is uh, mourning over t uh, Tamiz or Tamiz. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a false god anyways, so we don't need to pronounce the person's name, right? So anyways, she is mourning over this false god Tamiz who it's believed that this god or goddess, whatever, uh, is it, if, if it dies, so too does the land producing fruit and there being uh, fertility and all the things. And so they're supposed to mourn the death of that die, dead god in order that that god would come back. And that is the third in the abominations because I think God is looking at this, seeing that the people are now worshiping a dead God. Like, why would, you, why would you worship a dead God in exchange for the living God? Why would you worship something like that instead of me, who I am the living one true God? There's more abominations. And then the fourth one that Ezekiel sees is um, basically now in the temple, there are men with their backs towards the wall of the temple, and they are worshiping the sun god and worshiping towards the east. And God says to Ezekiel that, I lost my spot, that, um, have you seen this, O son of man? Verse 17. Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here, that they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger? Behold, they put a branch to their nose. If anything that you will see as we journey through Ezekiel is very graphic language, very graphic language. And this saying, they put a branch to their nose, is basically saying they gave a vulgar gesture to God, if you know what I mean. We have a different vulgar gesture when someone cuts us off, but basically the same idea, that this is what they have done. Therefore, I will act in wrath, God says. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's always a challenge preaching through Ezekiel and these prophets, especially when looking out, we all in this room are probably in different spots of our journey in knowing who Jesus is. Some of us may be just starting out some of us may be still seeking and looking, and, and talking about God's wrath and anger usually is not the best evangelical thing to do. <laughs> usually does not, you know, make them think, oh yes, please sign me up to the fact that there may be an angry God who's going to smite me and, and not hear my cries. But, but again, don't get, don't get bogged down. There is a reason why this is happening, and the reason being is that the wages of our sinfulness does lead us to death. 
we had this conversation with our kids the, of, of why, they keep asking, why can't sin be with God? And I'm thinking, why can't you not be pastor's kids and just ask normal questions? <laughs> why can't sin be with God? And we had to try to get them to that concept of understanding that it's not that God can't be with it, it's that it's just not possible. If God is the truest definition of good and holiness and righteousness, then that sin part is not an equation that maths out. It can't be a part of that. It's just doesn't, it doesn't math. The math doesn't math. It's not a possibility. And therefore, if it's not a possibility, it's discarded. It's gone. And so our sinfulness that has been invited in by our rebellion against God sets us apart from the Lord. There needs to be some sort of remedy that is in there. And the remedy, as we know, is Jesus Christ, and we'll get to that good news in a minute. But for those that don't do that, that don't follow that, they are going to experience what we're seeing here because that's, that's, that's the game. That's a part of the whole thing. Apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from God, we are dead in our transgressions. But through Christ, we receive life and sonship and daughtership with the Lord, and He sets us free from all of that punishment that we're reading about right now. What we're reading about right now is not God's desire for His chosen people. He doesn't want that stuff. But for those that do not bow a knee to the Lord, they will experience those things, and it's good that we understand those two parameters here. So, here we are with Israel, and what has happened here? We have these four abominations. They have crept further and further into their sin, and that's kind of how sin works. It starts us off very little, and then it expounds exponentially and brings us so far away from God before we even realize it. What is going on with Israel? Well, what has happened here and what Ezekiel is being shown is the outcome of what Israel asked all the way back with the prophet Samuel, who is the prophet that brings us King David, who is one of the best kings, if not the best king of Israel. But before all that happened, the people of Israel and the elders positioned Samuel and said to Samuel, we want a king, a judge, a ruler that makes us like all the other nations. We want somebody to judge us, to fight our battles. We want somebody to to be our king, to be our ruler. You put that person into place so that we can be like every other nation that has all of those things and be protected. And Samuel, the prophet, looks to God and says, I don't know what to do with these people. I don't know what this is totally, like, how could they ask for such a thing? And God says, you know what? Give it to them. They've asked for it. They are so lost in their transgressions. Go ahead and give it to them so that they can see what this is going to lead them to. But make sure you tell them, Samuel, what is going to happen. So Samuel does that. And so you would think that the people would hear Samuel, who is the mouthpiece of God, and be like, oh, wait, maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe we shouldn't do that. But they don't. They double down. And they say, nope, nope. Give us this king. Give us this ruler so that we can be like all the other nations. This is the outcome of being like all the other nations. God's plan for His chosen people was for 100% for them to not be like other nations. 100% for them to not be like other people. He calls them out of the other nations and He sets them apart as a holy people unto the Lord. Listen to Deuteronomy. Way back when, when the people of the Lord are being formed, listen to how God describes them. He says, you are a people holy, set apart sanctified, sacred, holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people from his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It is not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of the people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. Remember, God is real and his promises are real. He's keeping that oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he goes on to talk about all the blessings that come from this being a holy people, meaning not like everyone else. I didn't take you from all the nations. I took you as a few people and set you apart and made you holy so that the rest of the nations wouldn't understand who I am. And further in here, he says, and don't be afraid of the other nations. I'm going to deliver them to you. 
you will be fine. Keep my commandments, love me, walk in my ways, and everything is going to be great. And even says to them, verse 25 in Deuteronomy, about idols, those carved images of their gods, of the other nation's gods, you need to burn them. Burn them in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold that's on them or take it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared by it. He goes on to talk about as, 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 the, as Israel begins to take over other nations and then deliver to them, the whole idea was they were supposed to get rid of everything from that nation, all of the gods, all of the altars. They weren't supposed to intermarry with that, and that is not, you got to be careful, that is not a thing to say that races cannot intermarry. It's about allowing that culture to get ingrained into them and defile their one true God. But that's exactly what the elders and what Israel did. As they began to take over lands and God delivering lands to them, they didn't get rid of the high places. They didn't get rid of the altars. And they continued to engage in worship. And ruler after ruler after ruler of Israel led the people further and further and further into that type of worship. Now what we are seeing They've become like every other nation. And God is dealing with them like every other nation who is set against them, which is to wipe them out. Now, chapter 9 picks up. And chapter 9 says this. After God says, they, I will, they will cry to me and I won't hear them, then Ezekiel says, then God cries out and I hear him. And God cries out and brings forth some messengers and says to the messengers, I want you to go through the house of Israel. Mark on the head of anybody that mourns, that is stirred for the abominations that are against me. Basically, anyone whose heart is for me, put a mark on their head. Everyone else, take them out. They're all done. And takes them up. And that's that act of judgment that comes to, to the folks who have basically renounced God. The interesting thing about this that furthers my point that Israel has become like other nations is that the last time that God did this was in Egypt, and it was the Passover, and it was a foreign land, and they were all supposed to put the blood of the, of the lamb over their doorposts so that they would know that they were part of the house of the Lord and the angel would pass them by. But that was to enact judgment on the land of Egypt and its people. Now, this echo of Passover that's happening is happening in God's own nation. It's happening in his own house with his own people. This is what happens when we become like other nations. What we're learning here, the lesson that we're learning here, is about God's holiness. God's holiness for his people and God's holiness for us through, through Christ as well. We are not meant to be like the other nations. We are not meant to be like other people. And so if you take this and put this in our context right now, the idols that we fight, the idols that, we, that ensnare us are not these engraven images and things like that. We're not necessarily, unless you are, not necessarily burning incense or going up to the mountain to, to, to sacrifice an animal, unless you are. If you are, then let's talk later. But typically that's not necessarily happening. Our idol that gets into us is our own selves. And what I mean by that is that we live in a context right now that elevates the self as the Lord, as the supreme, as the power. And we listen to the messages of this world that say you can do whatever you want so long as it's only on you, and you can be whatever you want so long as it makes you happy and doesn't hurt anybody else. And it's this false message that has swept our time that people are searching for their identity in anything and everything else but him. Just like the idol that's in front of that north gate that is powerless, anything that isn't of the Lord that gives us our identity is powerless. And it's going to continue to take us on a path of unquenched thirst, to continue to look for other things and other avenues and other vices to give us some sort of power and some sort of self-worth because once again, God isn't relevant. He's not relevant. And that's the danger. That's why I had that exercise in the beginning. If it's not that first, you're, we're on that first trajectory of him not being 
relevant in our lives. So many times in marital counseling sessions, I have heard, especially when, when they are having struggles, usually what happens is that the most important person in their life is either their children, either their spouse, and it's not the Lord. And when it isn't the Lord, the whole thing is imbalanced. If the Lord is not the first thing, the most important thing in your life, you can't love your spouse the way that you are called and, and designed to love them. And with your spouse, if your children come before your spouse, you can't love your children in the way that God has sent the two of you up together to be ambassadors for those kids, to be a conduit of God's love. If they're taking the priority and the importance over your relationship, that's out of order. Now, the world probably says that's what you need to do. But we're not of the world. We're not like other people. That's what it means to be holy to be set apart, to be God's people. The call for us is to remember our holy status as we read these examples because we're no different than them. Be careful not to just look at this and say, you dumb Jews, don't do that. We are in the same boat and in the same type of of ensnarement. So my call for us is to remember our holy status, my friends. Remember that we are made holy through who? Jesus Christ. And if we have a confession in that and have been baptized into that, we are sealed into that family. Paul in Romans tells us that through Christ the Son, we are made sons and daughters of the God Most High. Through Jesus Christ, we are made co-heirs with His inheritance and receive everything that He receives because of Him being our brother, Christ our brother, and the right to call God Abba, Father, just as Jesus called. Don't forget that status that makes us different than everyone else in the world. When Jesus prayed for his disciples then and now, he says to God, I say to you, I pray to you, do not remove them from the world, but send them into the world even though they are not of the world. That's how God works in holiness. In the Old Testament, he took the one Abraham to make him a blessing for the many. And he took the one nation of Israel so that they would be a holy priesthood for all the nations so that they would be a light that knows who the one true God is. And in our time, we have Jesus, the one and only true Son who is the one true light. And because of him abiding and living in us, we share that light for the many. That's how God works. And so we cannot engage in these games anymore of elevating ourself and what the world says to be true because we want to be like everyone else. You are not like everyone else. And we are not stronger than the Lord. We are not more powerful than He. For as God shows Ezekiel that there's going to be a Passover of sorts, and we think, wow, that's harsh, all these people dead and dying. Look at what He says to the messengers, but put a mark on those who are following me Those who mourn about these abominations put a mark on their head and spare them. And even though Ezekiel asks the Lord, will you spare anybody, God? And God doubles down and says, I'm not going to hear or spare my eye at all. Yet we have what he says to the messengers. Spare those who mourn for the abominations. Spare those who are truly my children. God is real. God is faithful. He makes us not like other people, and we are not stronger than he is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So gracious Lord Jesus, I thank you again for (laughs) hard teachings, but positive teachings that in the midst of the fallen nature that we all struggle with and get ensnared into, oh my Lord, you do not leave us there. Help us to be mindful of our claimed by Christ status that makes us sons and daughters of you, the God most high, makes us different from everyone else so that we can be the light for everyone else. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh Lord, we ask that you speak. Speak and renew our minds. Allow the food in which we have partaken, both in the sacrament and your holy word, teach us of obedience, of righteous walking and living and holiness in you. Amen, my friends. We are not like the rest of the world. He has set us apart in his 
holy decree sanctifying us and making us sacred to be the lights to the world, to not blend into it without thinking, but to be a light into the world so that others may know the truth and the depth of the grace and love that is found in Jesus Christ. Go now with that good news, my friends, and share it to whomever God puts in your path. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Amen.